Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Houndsong Games, previous developer of Sea of Cinders. Well, kind of, but we'll get to that. Yeah, it's a now whole thing. Develop, now developing the Relict RPG, which is doing pretty well for itself on Kickstarter at the time of this recording. The one and only Christopher Corrigan. Hi, hello, everybody. hello. I am doing well, Mildred. Thanks for having me on. So, I so obviously, I'm, obviously, I mentioned um, Sea of Cinders er, earlier, and I, I do have to ask, was Sea of... Before, before we get into the origin story, was Sea of Senders ever technically finished? Uh, technically finished? No, we were at about... We were in layout, so I'll put it that way. We had most of the mechanical stuff was all ironed out. I was writing all of the lore for it. We had, you know, there were different regions, right? And we'd written maybe half of what we wanted in the book completely. So, like, we weren't coming across the finish line when uh, the OGL stuff hit. But we had done a bunch of, like, purely mechanical testing and, like, run a, a an offline, just kind of behind-the-scenes test campaign for a while. And things were working really well. And that was sort of the state it was at when I started hearing through the grapevine, like, people I knew were like, hey, something's coming. Um and so then history took a different path. <laughs> so, one of the um, for those who don't know, Sea of Cinders was uh, supposed to be the debut project of Hands On Games a couple of years ago, and it was a fifth edition expansion. It was a, a hard science fiction setting um, that myself and at the time a business partner had spent. It wasn't full time at that point, but we've been working on it for over a year. Um, with the goal of releasing like a hardcover Kickstarter book setting guide and all that kind of stuff. It was, it was, it was good. We were very happy with it. And uh, then it, you know, corporate did a corporate and uh, we're not doing that anymore. Uh, it will ride again in uh, as a relic setting eventually, but I got to get the system off the ground first. So here we are. Yeah. Don't have eyes bigger than your stomach. So... One of the oh, and oh, Mildred, I think I lost you again. Did you? Oh, there you are. So one of the traditions around here is, of course, the humble beginnings. So with that said, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, first introduction, very, very first. If you want to go way back, uh, I had a friend when I was. Had to be 13, 12 or 13. Uh, a friend of mine got one of the D&D starter boxes. And at the time, I think it must have been third edition. Like not even 3.5. I think this was before then. Um, and we just spent an afternoon not even playing all that much. Just kind of like explaining the game to me and like looking at the monsters and all this other stuff. And I, the part that I got stuck on, because we were huge like video game kids, right? And the part that I kept getting stuck on at that age was just like, what do you mean I can do anything? Like, what are you talking about? Like, what are the rules, though? Like, what are the moves that I'm allowed to do? And it's like, no, you can do anything. What? Um, and just, you know, it seems kind of silly looking back now, but, like, that was a very powerful notion of, like, oh, like, this is, this is like the imagination game. Like, this is something that I can come up with stuff and just ask you and you're going to make me roll something and something's going to happen. Like, that was really cool. Um, and then I promptly never got to play it uh, for another, like, five years. Because <laughs> uh, that's, you know, how it goes. Um, but yeah, I think that was my first experience. Uh, supplement with a lot of Neverwinter Nights when that came out a couple of years after that. Mm -hmm. And then in college, I got a couple of games going in different systems. Played Mage for a while. That was neat. Uh, tried to get a D&D &D game going. Never happened. Um, and then... Again, the long, dark period of not doing much, moving all over the country, doing stuff, and like being a new person in different places. Um, and then it wasn't until probably about six, seven years ago now, 
got to a point where it was like, okay, I want to play this. And, you know, the internet is a thing now and I can find people in my area to like sit and play with. Um, my brother wound up running an age game. Fantasy age was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Like and then uh, I, yeah, it's a good system. Um, some cool, cool moments there. Uh, and then eventually I got fed up trying to organize or trying to find games to join. And I just said, screw it. I'm going to learn how to be a GM. And then I became a forever DM. And uh, that turns out is a lot easier to get games going <laughs> when you're willing to do that. And so that was, yeah, five or six years ago and uh, haven't stopped since. It's been good. I uh, met my fiance playing fifth edition when I moved back to Virginia, as a matter of fact. Uh, so that's cool. That's a good bonus. Mm-hmm. That cer- that certainly makes sense. Yeah, maybe not the uh, the most original origin story there, but I feel like it's pretty typical for for folk of my age. <laughs> um, I have I have been doing these interviews for about five years now. There is no origin story that I haven't heard before. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Uh so if everybody who tells me that they have a weird origin story, I'm like, nope, no, you don't. Nah. The nah, only, not at all. Um, uh, the only, t- I think the only time that the only there's certainly ones that are more unorthodox, and I know some might say, well, well, of course the origin story was D and D, not as many as you'd think. Really interesting. Well, yeah, and actually, I believe that because if you go back more than a couple of years, like. You know, it's easy to forget now 5th edition is the juggernaut in the industry, but prior to, you know, 3.5 even, it was much smaller for one. Well, and a lot- you also have to keep in mind that um, there, w- there was the um, D&D more or less skipped the late 90s. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, because, t- because TSR by way of by way of by way of Williams was being was being was being Williams because no one else wanted to. Right, right. Yeah, actually come to think of it, I remember <laughs> this will age me going to books a million. Um I remember finding uh the RA is it Salvatore books, mm-hmm. uh, like Brunor Battlehammer and Wolfgar and all of them and like picking up a couple of those and like getting into this series. Because uh, I was a huge, like, just fantasy and sci-fi reading nerd growing up. Go figure. Um, and I remember, I think I got, like, three or four books into the Dritz novels before I was like, wait, are these a game? Like, what is this from? Like, I don't... <laughs> like, it was just so far outside of my zeitgeist, I guess. Um, it's probably not the right use of that, but whatever. Um yeah, just funny. I just remember getting really into these stories and then finding out, like, what do you mean it's, oh, it's Forgotten Realms? I've never played that. What is that? I'm like, oh, well, it's D&D. Well, I thought it was Forgotten Realms. It was very confusing, but uh, it just wasn't in my daily life, you know? It was This is pre-internet and all that kind of stuff, so you just don't know it if you don't see it. Yeah. Now, with that in mind, I, th- I think one of the big questions is a kind of chicken and egg situation of... <laughs> Was Relic something that you were already kicking about before everything went to shit during the whole OGL fiasco last year, or was this something that you were already that you already that um you ended up developing right at right after that went down? So Relic was, and it didn't even have a name at the time. Uh, Relic was something that I had started kind of messing around with in a very raw, basic form. Uh, probably four or five months before the OGL stuff at the turn of the year. Um, purely kind of a behind the scenes, like, okay, after we do see a cinders and like, that's going to be the big thing for the next couple of months, a year or so. Um, but like, I have all these other ideas for like, you know, what could a game be that's not in the fifth edition architecture? Uh, one big drive for me was, uh, I'm a fantasy author. Um, my novel's Tattered Pawns, check it out. Um, and like a frustration was like, I wrote this book and I came up with this world and all these characters and everything. And I was like, there's no way to build these kinds of characters in 5e. Like you just, the classes don't match. It doesn't line up. Um, and so a frustration for me was like, I want to play a tabletop game. This is like a big part of my life now uh, where I can play the kinds of characters that I like to write and that I like to explore and do all this other stuff. 
So that's kind of where Relic started. Um, having said that, the OGL situation changed what the plan was pretty significantly. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there is probably a world where... Um, I think there's probably a world where if that never happened, Relic, if it ever came out, would have been maybe a hardcover, you know, straight to Kickstarter thing where it was like, I invented this system or maybe I shop it around and try and get it published or team up with somebody. I don't know. Um, Post OGL, it was kind of like, okay, uh, if this is going to be the focus and I'm not going to worry about doing 5e stuff anymore, what makes sense to kind of get this out there and like make this be the foundation that I start to build more adventures and modules and settings like Sea of Cinders and stuff on. Uh, so that's when it pivoted to be like being like, well, what if I hosted the whole thing on a website? And well, how do I do memberships? This thing? And I was like, you know what? Screw it. What if I just, what if we just put it out for free? Like it's, it's a system, get it out there, get people playing it, uh, get them to enjoy it. And since I'm so pissed off at the OGL stuff, it's going to go under an open license. And if someone else wants to make a game with it, they can like, that's going to be enshrined in the bedrock of the system. Um, and so that, you know, I think I'm very happy with where it wound up out of all of that. I don't know if it would have gone this direction had that not occurred. So in a weird way, I guess, thank you, Hasbro. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how that happened. Mm-hmm. Um, the Now, with that in, with that in mind, the the main thing the main thing there's a couple of things that. I appreciate I appreciate that you have the at the bullet points right out of the gate, so I don't have to jump around to figure out how things are going to work. But first <laughs> and first and foremost, um, I want to talk about the setting agnostic part of things. Yes, absolutely. Because this ties into a bit of a pet peeve that I've had with D and D for decades now. Because I've seen. As an aside, I've seen some people assume that I got started with like fifth edition. No, I got started with the black books of AD and D second when I was ten years old. Right. Um, yeah. Um. But there has been this shit or get off the pot mentality when it comes to what sort of setting, what sort of fantasy D and D is supposed to be. Mm-hmm. The problem, and I. I've seen a lot of people say, "Oh, you can you you can use it to run all kinds of fantasy." This is a this is a this is like saying that um, Gary Coleman is a taller version of Webster. You're <laughs> technically correct, but it's entirely misleading. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the the problem the problem with that is there are certain first off, fantasy is a very wide net, and there are certain types of fantasy that it's going to skew towards more than others in the overall design. Mm-hmm. And while you can while you can veer away from that, depending on where what direction you're veering, it's going to it's going to involve more house rules or extra work for the GM. And Sure. Like could I could I use could I use D&D and and run a um and run a in, and run an Indian themed campaign like a, like I'm running the tabletop version of a Bollywood movie. Yeah, I'd have to house rule the hell out of it to the point where I'm not house ruling anymore. I'm basically a des- I'm basically an unpaid designer, but I could do it for sure, for sure. And that's that fine print that isn't brought up when that when that argument is made. And my question is, when it comes to the setting agnostic, is is it a case where if somebody wanted to do that hypothetical fantasy India or fantasy Japan or the, or the like, it could be done. Not necessarily universally. I think this is still leaning into fantasy, but that wide, but that wide net. Yeah, it's a great question. So, to me, setting agnostic is the way I look at it is this: uh, when we're talking about relic RPG as a system. I am not, and I think D and D is actually a great example of where this line gets complicated and fuzzy sometimes, especially when you get into like rules, a lot of legacy rules and lore and everything, because they're very tied into Forgotten Realms and like there's stuff where if you want to play outside of an official 
I guess Planescape kind of works, but in a, even an official like Forgotten Realms adventure setting, like there are elements of like your classes and your lore and your backgrounds and your character building where things have to kind of tweak a little bit in order for it to make any sense. So for me, it's there is nothing inherent in the relics like mechanical system that pegs it to, oh, you want to be a paladin? Well, that means you worship a god, and that means that a god has to be this, and da 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 It's like, no, you can use mechanically this class, and it can be something else that is more relevant to your world or whatever. Um, there are sections, because you have to make some assumptions if you're going to make like a complete product, right? Uh, there are sections that I identify on the website, and there's little notes for me throughout there where it's like, there's a, there's a cosmology section. Where I say, hey, this is the default working assumption of like what magic is and how it works for a relic-powered game. If you want to throw it out as a GM or as a homebrew, or if you're another publisher who wants to make your own thing, here's what it affects. And like, so here's a list. So it's not so much that like there is no flavor whatsoever or that it's all vanilla and it can all be plugged into anything. It's that I'm making a conscious effort to be like, okay, here is where the line is. I'm going to go over that line to make sure that if someone doesn't want to do all that work, they can just pick this up and run with it. But if you as a developer or as a GM or as a home brewer want to change something, I'm going to flag it and say, Hey, here's, here's what would need to change. If you want to do this, that, or the other thing. A good example is like, uh, I provide, there's a section in the running the game kind of GM tools area. That's about different travel times. And it's like, okay, well, you know, and, you say at the top, like, all right, most campaigns, you don't really care how long it takes you to ride a horse from town A to town B. But in some games, that's really important. Like, I've run a pirate ship campaign before. Yeah, navigating between islands is a super important part of that experience. So here's how we run it. Like, here's, you know, if you're pushing hard, if you're pushing easy, storms, this, that, and the other thing. And within that, I break down, like, all right, if you're running a fantasy game, here's horseback, here's flying on a griffin, here's flying on a drag, whatever, da, da, da. Hey, if you want to do an industrial game, here's how long it takes a train to go different places. If you're running a fantasy game, you don't care. If you want to run something more like Eberron, yeah, that's kind of important. So to me, it's just kind of providing those options and building it in such a way that those things can be added or subtracted without being detrimental to the system functioning, which is where I think a lot of cross-setting stuff gets in the weeds in the the past and other places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, for me, it's just a matter of in, of I see a, I see a lot of games talk about how talk about how they're running quote unquote generic fantasy, but generic well, fantasy is not, <laughs> is not is not generic, and that's still a wide wide ass net, like Grand yeah, Canyon kind of wide. Yeah, you could call Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings generic fantasy, but they're not like they don't cross pollinate really. Yeah, and if you if you tried to make them cross pollinate, um, <laughs> I um, I don't, I do, I do not, I do not endorse, I do not endorse someone walking the plank. That's just that's. I don't, I don't endorse, I don't endorse um people getting publicly keel hauled. Oh uh, sure, sure. Thing. You know, or not, or 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 flogged, or what have you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But moving on to the next part, the lonely D twelve gets some love with this with this system. So <laughs> I do have to ask: Is this a case where you're where um where you're rolling a single D twelve, a a small set? Are you rolling a success based pool? What is the core mechanic of relic in that situation? Sure, sure. Uh, so it is. Uh, it, it's you still use a full um, seven dice set, uh, like a D twenty set. Uh, the difference is we actually went to the D twelve being the primary check dice instead of the D twenty. Um, so if you've played, you know, I know for a fact you have, but for the listeners, if you've played uh, Pathfinder or Five E or whatever, same kind of idea. You have a bunch of different dice, different effects will call you to roll different dice from that set. Uh, but for us, the D12 is the default. And then there are some reasons to increment up and down. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's kind of the whole shtick there. Um, but we went with the D12. I always say we. It's me. Me and my testers. I, it feels like a team, but, you know, it's just me. <laughs> uh, went with the D12 because we do some interesting stuff with uh, critical 
rolls, like rolling a 12 on a d12, leads to a lot more options than in, you know, like a d20 or a standard like D&D type game. So bumping up the percentage that that happens just a little bit goes to eight and a half, eight and change percent instead of uh, 5% of your rolls, uh, just led to some more fun kind of gameplay loops and mechanics. Uh, so that's why that's that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they're neat. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. So it's so it's more it's more of a varied die pool instead of one particular die as the Rome and the whole, and the whole all roads lead to Rome. Yeah. So the, there's a lot of you know if you're making the GM calls for a check or you make an attack or you know you make a spell attack or whatever you're gonna roll a d12 and you're gonna add your modifiers different stuff feels very familiar right. Um, rolling damage and different stuff you'll use you know this weapon does d6 damage this weapon does d8 damage whatever. Uh, the interesting stuff, and part of the reason, the other reason we wanted to bump down that kind of range of standard dies that are commonly available is because there are uh, moments where you will increment up or down as a way of kind of balancing or weighing a dice roll. So like, for example, range weapon attacks. Uh, if your bow has a range of 60 feet, okay, you're rolling D12 plus your, plus your to hit bonus. Okay, great. That's your, that's your range within 60 feet. But you have the option to do what's called a long shot, double it 120 feet, but instead of rolling a d12, you're going to roll a d8. And you can double it again, so we go into, oh, 240 feet. Instead of rolling a d8, you're going to go down to a d4. Uh, so there are moments where we kind of play with this stuff, and you can you know spend resources to artificially stack up to get that extra, you know, try and make the super long shot successful. Um, but you're also not going to crit when you're doing that. So that's, we, we play with these little systems and kind of tweak the math back and forth and kind of move up and down that range. And having a dice that's more in the middle of that range is, uh, is handy for that kind of thing. Uh, all right. I can, I can get that. One of the other things that certainly got my attention is it's a lot, as I understand it, it's a lot easier in this system to multiclass. In fact, you outright encourage it if, if not, require it it is it is outright outright required really um so the way uh building a character in relict works is you go through the system and you pick two or three of the classes that are built into the system uh so you might pick like an assassin shadow mage or a uh warrior berserker or something or you know plague doctor or whatever we got a we got a bunch um all of those are designed as kind of like half or a third of a character and what you're actually doing is building a class by combining them in whatever way you want to combine them. So if you find something, you know, really that speaks to you about the core kind of like mechanics and gameplay loop of one and another that you think would either complement it or just be weird and fun to play, you put them together and that becomes your class for your character. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of gets back to that origin story of me being like, I really want to be able to build characters that act like the, the characters that I'm writing that I'm playing that I like from stories or movies or whatever. And uh, just having this super flexible system where you can kind of mix and match really, really works out pretty well. Yeah. I know, I know some people who, ascri who ascribe to the old school mindset are like, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be trying to play X. You should try and play a character that you bit that you build. And nope, I'm like, a lot of people get into various forms of fantasy through fiction and they're going to want to, and the idea of them wanting to play an XP of a character that they happen to connect with, that's something. That's not something that should be shunned. That's something that should be encouraged. And when they don't get that same feeling, they're a little bit less inclined to come back. A hundred percent. I mean, like, listen, if someone really is excited to come to my table and play in my game... Uh, I'll give you a, it's a really wholesome example, which is funny because I'm running all this Eldritch Horror stuff right now, but whatever. Uh, there is wholesomeness in Eldritch uh, Horror. Yeah. Uh, my little nieces are super excited to play a game right now, and I'm you know, not going to talk too much about them because they're children, but they're young kids. Uh, they really want to play a game. They know Uncle Chris has been working on this system for the past year, and they're really excited about it, and they're asking about characters and all this other stuff. And, you know, they are children. And they have their favorite characters and their favorite shows and whatever. And they came in and one of them was looking at all the options and I'm like walking her through it and being like, oh yeah, you could do this. This one cast spells like this, da, da, da. 
And she just looks at me and goes, oh my God, can I be Korra from Avatar? And I was like, absolutely. We could combine uh, an elementalist and, uh, you know, this other class. And I think she did an elementalist um, dynamancer. Uh, I was just like, oh my God, I could be Korra. And I was like, yeah, you could, that would absolutely be a Korra build. You could do fire and ice and this and that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she actually picked dynamancer because she wanted to do earthbending better. So that's awesome. Um, and then her twist on it was like, well, I want, could Cora be a fairy? Cause I want to fly and be a, be a little pixie. And I was like, fucking, yeah, that's awesome. I don't care. That's great. <laughs> like if that's what gets her into it and gets her excited to come play and like learn all this stuff. And by the way, she's a kid. It's good for her to learn math and imagination and problem solving. And that's a whole other soapbox. I don't give a shit if it's coming from a Nickelodeon show, you know, like that's, she's excited about it. Let her have fun. That's great. I'll usually end up at, asking i usually end up writing a primer for every for any campaign that i write and usually sure. that will have um reference materials absolutely because because i am i am what i am because even though some people are going to try and argue otherwise everybody made ever everybody in back in the day made some x made some xp of like conan Everybody, um, yeah. <laughs> they're pretty sure there were plenty of people in the '90s whose characters were just a poor man's version of like Blade or a- or mm-hmm. Ash Williams or some or something like that. And absolutely, that is always going to happen, no matter what you do or say. So instead of trying to fight that, run with it. Because yeah, got exactly, big, you've got a big opportunity right in right in your damn lap. Yeah, like it's like like we are all you know. I feel like as fans of this industry and, and gaming and science fiction and fantasy, et cetera, et cetera. Like we are all by definition fans of these other things that are out there in this genre and these franchises and these you know the stories, whatever. I don't know what this impulse is to pretend that we're not when we're playing. Like it's just it's very odd to me. Um, where there's your a, there's where your inspirations proudly. That's that's where. I say this as a career professional creative who's, who's done a bunch of different stuff. Like that is where everything comes from is what inspired you when you started. And then things change as you develop it. There's a phrase that my cut that one of my colleagues has used very frequently. And that is you play elf games. And the intent with that is this is a game to, this is still a game. Games are meant to be fun. Get your head out of your ass. You know, a lot of a lot of people take it take it a bit seriously, and my and Discord decided to mess with me again. Sorry about that. Discord decided to act like I didn't want to talk because <laughs> I had said my I had said before Discord rudely interrupted me. I had said that my colleague has a saying: "You play elf games." I mean, statistically, what was the the D and D Beyond breakdown on character builds? They may not be wrong anymore. <laughs> i i take I take those breakdowns with a big grain of salt because I don't mm-hmm. know um, I don't know the full range of demographics or even the even the sample size of those surveys taken. Mm-hmm. And if it's if it's like a hundred or two hundred people, that's not that's not enough to piss in a pot. Well, and also, like, is it measuring active characters or is it measuring, like, one guy who makes a thousand variations of the same character in their database? Like, who knows? Mm. Um, but uh, it's just always interesting. There's a Human reason champion why, fighter. <laughs> there's a reason why Churchill had that line about the three kinds of lies. Oh, yeah. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. Mm-hmm. It's a good one. Yeah. My mother used to quote that. <laughs> well, it's, it's, a good, it's a good line. And I... I will admit one one thing that I see within Relic that definitely ha- that um I definitely approve of is the fact that unless I, unless I am misreading things, you're using a spell you're using a spell point setup instead of you instead of using the Vancian model. I am very grateful for that because I've certainly um fallen out of favor with that whole Vancian model because I never liked it. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, we use uh, mana and stamina points as our abilities. And, you know, we talked in the pre-roll a little bit about, like, Magic the Gathering. Uh, the example I use to kind of get it in people's heads is, like, if you played Diablo, you know, the mana bubble that goes up and down on the side as you're playing? That's, that's what we're talking about here. Um, so you, character, based on your stats and your build and your class and all the other stuff, you have stamina and mana. All characters have it. You have a maximum pool that you can draw from, and you can spend it in increments to power up your abilities to cast them initially, and then you can upcast it. Uh, it's another big mechanic of the system is, like, you might have a spell that's, like, shoot a firebolt. Uh, and it might be two mana. Great. Uh, but it might say, for an additional five mana, the firebolt goes twice as far and does twice as much damage. Um, and then some other ones are like, you can spend extra mana in increments of three. So you could do three, six, nine, da, 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 and it does extra stuff on top of it. So it's a way to kind of have some extra flexibility in there and give your existing skills kind of more potency as you level up and get better and have more resources at your disposal. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's been the thing. And the big feedback I've gotten from players uh, running that, especially players, a lot of people come from 5e or Pathfinder. Um, one of the most consistent pieces of feedback has been, I like this because I can cut loose. Because I know my skills are coming, my spells are coming back. I might have to, you know, do something else for a turn and recharge. But there's no, like, I'm in an encounter. I'm a fire mage, but I don't want to cast fireball because I might need to cast fireball tomorrow, which might be in three sessions because the real, real world has schedules and stuff. Uh, so you don't ever have to be like, well, I don't want to be a hero right now because this fight may not be the big one. Have, and, have yeah. you ever heard, have you ever heard of the rainy day paradox? Uh, is that uh, I always save all of my big stuff until the boss fight, and then I don't use them because there might be a bigger boss fight. Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, I sometimes call it ninety nine mega elixirs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or the uh, what, what was that old um, God? The bullet hell game, the top down where you're playing the ship, you just scroll back and forth shooting at everything. I was saved idea up all. Do you have any idea yeah, there's how a million of them. It down? I know there's a million of them, but there's always like a screen clearing bomb attack, right? And I always save all of them until I die because I refuse to use them because the boss is going to come any minute now. Mm -hmm. um, so you know those are those are things that I keep in mind when I'm designing my uh, my action economy it's just like no you're you built a hero you want to play a hero go nuts i've got plenty of ways to hurt you you're not use a fireball i don't care like <laughs> um yeah the gm has an infinite difficulty slider i'll hurt you if i wanna you can you can go nuts you can have fun um and uh it's it's worked out really well it's been it's been a very consistent point of positive feedback amongst my players yeah. and the other thing that's cool is they use it in role playing too when you don't have this spell slot mechanic where you're afraid to use any of your big stuff outside of like cantrips or throwaway spells, uh, players solve problems in weird, fun ways that are true to their characters. Like I was running a dungeon crawl with, um, I had two blink mages in my party. Um, blink mage is a relic class, uh, which it doesn't deal any direct damage and it should strike fear in the hearts of every GM out there. And it is my favorite class. All it does is teleport. I teleport, you teleport, that thing teleports. That's its skill set. Um, there's limitations, you know, line of sight, and it causes noise and does all this other stuff, so it's not just insanity. Uh, but when that class, multi-class with other things to fill different niches, is present in a room where there's a ticking clock and a deadly trap and the room is collapsing and puzzles to be solved and whatever, the problem solving that comes up goes haywire and it is so much fun just to run as a gm and the players are having a blast uh because it's like oh well here's the thing i can fold space and time so um what are we gonna do lava's rising here we go uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. but you know if they were like well i only have one teleport spell and we've got we might be in this dungeon for five more sessions i can't use it yet you just get a guy who's running and trying to climb a rope and that's that's not as cool in my opinion yeah. um now as I understand it, when it comes to your choice, when it comes to your class setup, you can you can go the two class or the three class setup. Two Correct. classes, you pick a major, minor, and then generalist. Three yes. is major, minor, and influence. Correct. So, given, I'd, imag I'd imagine that there's advantages and disadvantages to both. What would the, what would those be? 
So Generalist actually was not originally part of the early, early build of Relict. Um, that was a piece of like Discord community feedback. Uh, so speaking from a kind of gameplay balance, keeping the party, you know, everyone's kind of roughly at the same level of capability wise. Uh, Generalist, what it does is it provides you with a steady stream of like mathematical buffs as you go up. So you get some extra perks, you know, like, uh, to unlock and get different like sub buffs and abilities and stuff. Um, and you get some extra stat boosts along the way as you level up. Um, and then influence class, if you go that route, you just have access to another class's worth of skills and like level one passives and everything. Um, the reason, so in terms of like parity and power and everything, they're about the same. Uh, the reason why people wanted that and they quickly convinced me when people brought it up um, some players really like to have three classes worth of spells and abilities and just kind of mix and match and do crazy stuff with. Uh, for some players, especially when it, it's like, there were like two main camps. It was people who were new to the system can find that overwhelming, which I totally understand. It's a lot to manage if you pick like a bunch of like really utility spell casters and all of a sudden you got all these spells and you don't, you know, you're not memorized, you're not immersed in the system yet. Totally absolutely valid um and then some people are just like listen man i want to play a cool warrior and i've already built that with these two classes why do i need to stick another third class on here that i'm just i'm not interested in and i'm like all right i mean that's fair that's totally fair uh so some people want the more focused two class plus generalist you get some nice math on top of that great and then some people like me i'm a chaos goblin like i like to just have three classes that are built out of madness and, and <laughs> bad ideas um, and smack them together and just have a bunch of spells to pull out and do all sorts of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how those two things marry up there. Yeah. And if you, since I, um, I don't see, and I don't see a case where, so, where someone's picking uh, where the, where the classes are explicitly listed as major or minor. So what would, I'll use Warrior as an example. Um, what would be the difference if you picked Warrior as a major class versus picking it as a minor class? And... God damn it. That's three for three now with Discord messing with me. What the hell? <laughs> I've learned to uh, just expect it. We're all, yeah. it's all good. I was saying, where, where do you, where's the dividing line in your opinion between picking warrior as a, if, what would, what would be the difference between picking warrior as a ma as a major class, as a minor class and as an influence class? Yeah. Okay. So the way these work, so I, we explained you've got mana and stamina to power up and use your abilities, right? Mm -hmm. um, so all of you, when you build your character, out of whatever combination of classes you want. Uh, you have access to the skill sets in all of those classes from level one. Uh, there's some very rare instances with like some really nitty gritty mage classes where they can unlock special ones as they level up. But uh, for the most part, as a general rule, you have access to the entire skill tree, as it were, off the bat. Because I think you should get to play your hero uh, that you want to play uh, when you build your character. I think that's fun. Um, so let's say your warrior has an ability where they trip people and it costs two stamina. Uh, so that's as your major class, that's pretty easy to do. You're probably regenerating a lot more than that every turn. Okay, great. Uh, if you slot that warrior class into your minor class, your second one, uh, that ability is now going to cost four stamina. All of the costs double. Um, and if you slot it into your influence class, it doubles again. So that ability now costs eight stamina, which is quite significant. Mm -hmm. um, as you level up, there is an option at certain levels to pick abilities from your minor and influence class and remove that multiplier. So if you're a warrior who's got a mage class as a, as a minor or influence, and you really like this like enchant flaming sword ability, but it's really expensive. Well, at a certain level, you could be like, no, actually, that is just no cost multiplier on that now. That is part of my core essence of my character. So that's how you kind of grow into these multi-class roles. It just brings it in and makes it super efficient to do the things you like to do. 
Uh, the other thing is that whatever your major class is, that's also where you get what's called specializations, which are the choices you make as you level up. Um, and those are tied into kind of what the core like gameplay loop of that class is. So like warrior gets like multi attacks and like bonuses to using certain types of weapons. Whereas something like, you know, the blink mage I brought up before gets the ability to like double blink and like do extra things or blink other people or send things the other way. So whatever you pick as your major class is also going to have those level up options kind of built on as well. So you're both, you advance in all your levels as you go, but you're also picking ways to further specialize into like the core thing you do and bring in those minor and influence class abilities as part of that as your character grows. Mm -hmm. uh, so to answer your question, it comes down to what you want to be your core thing. If you want to run a, if you ran a warrior blink mage for a campaign, that's going to be a really cool heavy hitter weapon user, weapon expert type guy who can do a lot of mobility stuff and move all around the, the battlefield and encounters. You could flip that in another character and do a blink mage warrior, and that's going to be a hyper mobile, manipulating the terrain, manipulating people and objects, moving around, kind of setting up the battlefield or the encounter or the puzzle how you want. And you can fall back on this like warrior skill set when you get in trouble. So like those two characters are going to play very differently, even if you use the same classes and just tweak the order there. So it really comes down to what your preference is. Yeah. It also, unless I, if I'm understanding this correctly, one of the big things that you have when it comes to the attached set, the attached setting within within the relic book, which I'm glad that there is a attached setting instead of um, throwing people into the sink. <laughs> yeah um, yeah we are developing uh actually multiple settings that are, are coming out in all this but you gotta start somewhere right yeah i don't the worst the worst way to learn how to swim is somebody push you in the deep end and then and say swim damn it now that <laughs> yes exactly um, is that ev is that um everyone has the potential for magic in some form which is why there's the which is why there's the concept of ether type in your choice of species. Correct. Yeah. Uh, now. Yeah. What was with what was the intent of doing that to kind of have magic the way like the way like key or the force is used where it where anybody can potentially use it but it does take practice to actually master. Yeah, so the the metaphor, I, I, depending on where you're reading this, you might be staring at exactly what I'm about to say. Um, but the metaphor I use is think of magic like music in the real world. Everybody can clap their hands, usually, um, or beatbox or whatever. Uh, most people know someone or are someone who can play an instrument pretty well. A couple people in your life probably play something or play multiple things really, really well and are like really impressive and have developed that skill. Mm hmm there's only a couple Jimi Hendrixes in every generation, you know? Uh, so it's a matter of like, maybe you just have this knack or maybe it's something you really dedicated an enormous amount of your life to develop into an incredible thing. But that doesn't mean that your next door neighbor can't just like, you know, slap his chest in the shower and uh, come up with a little tune. And that's what he does in that, on that spectrum, you know? Yeah. Um, so the yeah the idea of that was like I wanted to open it up from. I would, it's, I'm, I'm big on busting archetypes, so like a big thing in Relict is like that you can optimize a character build to like make sure these two classes go together really well, and like there's fun in that, and I encourage people to do that if that's what you know excites you about a character, go for it. Uh, but I also enjoy. I have always enjoyed building weird, like non-optimal characters that do crazy things. And so that's really kind of baked into the heart of like this character system is like, yeah, if you want to be a warrior necromancer, do it. Uh, you, that class may not be mathematically as ideal as it possibly could be, but in this world, in this kind of system, there's no reason that you can't have an excellent time as a player and be effective and useful for your party by combining those skill sets. And we'll see what happens, you know? Mm-hmm. So with that in with that in mind, the I'd like to kind of dive into what the th what the um, theme is between the difference of flow and reservoir. Sure. Obviously, there's yeah. the there's the benefit and the risk to them, but 
generally generally speaking what what would be the dividing line between when it, if somebody was to house rule an additional species um what would what kind of traits would be would lean more towards flow what kind of traits would lean more towards reservoirs is there a kind of consistent theme in that sense yeah, so that is actually uh, pulled straight from uh, my book, as a matter of fact. Uh, so what this is referring to is, in Relict, the general like overall cosmology, the idea is that the material plane exists in a within a plane of energy, and when you do magic, you pull energy out of that, channel it through your body, and bend it to different effects. Uh, creatures that have what's called a reservoir always are carrying a little bit of that energy kind of in themselves, metaphysically, in their soul, in their body, however you want to kind of flavor that. Uh, but they're always kind of holding a little bit of that energy there. So they've got that buffer if they're ever cut off, so they can kind of draw down from that internal battery, but there also is a buffer tank to like fill up. Um, if you think about it like a river, you've got a little buffer uh, silo that's got to fill up before you can open the spigot again. Uh, the flow creatures are just an open tap. So they can spit out more on demand, but if they ever get cut off, there's nothing to fall back on. Uh, in terms of like homebrewing, and I think I even say this on the website, uh, if in your world as a GM, you wanted to switch something like you know, dwarves are supposed to be flow, but I want them to be reservoir in my world or whatever, you can do that. The really important thing mechanically is that it's just consistent. You don't want characters to like flip-flop on that once they start running into things that can like cancel magic or suppress magic or whatever. Uh, but in terms of like world building, you can kind of just decide. For me, it's always like anything and you know you can you don't even have to do it by species necessarily. You can do it by character. But for me, it's always like any species that has sort of supernatural ties. So like fiendlings are a good example where they're like crossbred with, with infernal blood somewhere back in the line. Yeah. All right. So that's more, they have an internal source of metaphysical power. Great. Whereas humans are default mundane, whatever. Uh, so they're flow cause they learn how to reach out and tap into it, but it's not an essence of themselves that gets into kind of squishy, uh, you know, lore building stuff. It doesn't have to be one way or the other. It's kind of up to you to draw where that line is going to be if you want to change it. But if not, I've provided it just as built into the system so you don't have to think about it if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's one of the, it's one of those things where I think I think guidance is all is always going to be appreciated. Sure, sure. Because again, the last thing that anybody wants is to throw is to throw people right in the middle of it and just of course. Just assume oh. Oh, we. Oh, you're genre savvy enough to fi to figure it out. No, I've seen I've seen that with some narrativist games. I'm not, I'm not a fan of, of that because sure. every game is someone's first. The, yeah, the absolutely. Whole, or say to use Five E as an example, that whole, that whole thing of oh, we left the cra we left the crafting rules blank because because we trust that you guys could figure it out on your own. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is why you have a bunch of third-party crafting rules that go all over the place and there's no consistency. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I've straight up had a player be like, I found these crafting rules in this uh, one guidebook. And I was like, okay, I, that's fine. <laughs> we'll use that for you. I, that, yeah, whatever. Um, I know what you're talking about there. Yeah, so I mean, if I can put a finer point on it, to me, if a creature is somehow mythological in your world probably going to be a reservoir ether type if it's mundane uh you know something that is just a standard humanoid person uh no one's like oh orcs have magic blood or whatever then they're probably going to be a flow type hmm. that's that's how it goes yeah now i did i did look through the classes and i'd probably i'd probably have to do i'd probably have to do a little bit of cr of creative use because I because obviously given my name, I lean a little <laughs> bit towards the monks, and I think I think with the classes that are available, I'd have to get a little creative. So it's really funny you bring that up. Um, someone on my Discord uh, like two days ago, um, I assume came in from the Kickstarter, but uh, maybe maybe not. Uh, 
literally sent me a message and was like, or got on the, the general feedback chat and was like, how would I build like a pugilist, like monk type class? Um, and so we started talking about it. And uh, so a couple of things. Um, my suggestion was start with a warrior and specialize in the bludgeoning damage and take all of the unarmed attack bonuses and stuff if you want to go that way. Um, through that conversation, I actually wound up, he made some great points and we went back and forth a little bit. I added a couple of perks to make unarmed attacks more effective and like increase critical range and increase, you know, damage rolls and da, da, da. Um, so that was just, um, you know, this is a nice thing about being a one man team. If the community comes to me with good feedback and makes good points, I will add things and change things for them. So that was that was fun. That was a constructive conversation. Um, that has now started a conversation in the Discord. There's a couple of guys going back and forth about how to build like a martial arts fighter class, like unarmed fighter specialist. Um, and they've got some good ideas, and it's probably going to happen. Um, so I can offer you uh, some hope on the horizon if that is your thing. Mm-hmm. Um. The though because because of the mult because of the way multi classing works in this kind of thing, whoever's doing that, I would advise them to strictly focus on the martial arts part, not try and do that weird ass g- gish kind of stuff by bringing in the concept of key abilities. Um, that that was actually one of the big points. Is like I think that has not. Those two things don't have to go together in the way that they are often packaged together in a lot of games. We know what we're talking about here. Um, And I think there's a lot of agreement there. It's like, it's more fun to focus on a character that is just doing like Aikido and MMA and jujitsu moves and like submissions and arm bars and all this other kind of stuff. Um, And then you can multi-class it with a mage or a a rogue. It doesn't matter. um, When you're dealing with, you're only picking one class for the majority of your career, then I can understand the idea of putting in multiple of, of putting in multiple um, roles within that class or multiple potential exactly. avenues. Yeah. But the multiple potential avenues in this case is covered by the way you handle multi-classing. So there's exactly no need to to do that. If somebody wanted to have those sort of key effects in that in this kind of situation, I'd probably say, "Well, look look at." Look at one of the mage classes and think and think about it that way. Oh. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like you could combine a class like that with an elementalist and do, uh, you know, a four ways elemental fighter, mm-hmm. or you could combine it with a shadow mage and do all sorts of shadowy eldritch inky stuff. Like there's a lot of ways to combine that, and it is kind of built into the system that way. So yeah, um, I think yeah they've they've made a really good case, and I think that is something that is going to go on the roadmap here shortly. Mm-hmm. Um, Initially, that was something that I had not put on because I was worried as I was developing classes that there was going to be just either it wasn't going to have its own like unique niche because like if it's just this is before I had built like warrior and scoundrel and some of these other classes and I was like well I don't really know how those are going to come together yet I know they're going to be there let's see Um, because it's important to me that each class kind of has its own like loop of like here's what I do and here's what I'm good at and here's what's fun to play. Uh, but now that those have kind of settled into their niches, uh, I think they've identified some cool stuff that that would add to the the overall pool. So I'm I'm all I'm all for it. If if someone ha- if someone had stated that um, just being a pugilist isn't isn't quite enough, then I I probably argue that that focus in, focus instead on things like co- things like combination attacks, things like co- things like um, low low def- low defense, high evasion, good good at um, not getting hit. Not as good as take. Not as good as taking the the hits when they come. When they come, those are those yeah, are some yeah. possibilities. But the comboist part is the um, bigger one, which leads me to one of my one of my next questions, and that is how you're handling um, action economy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so relic uses a two action economy. Um, with a reaction, so there is that kind of there is some outside of your turn stuff in terms of reactions and conditional free actions. So some an ability might say, when you do this, do this other thing as a free action, whatever. Um, but we went to uh, two actions after a good bit of testing um, and opened up what those could be. Uh, so you have two actions. It can be movement. It can be casting a spell. It can be using a skill. It can be making an attack. Uh, a lot of other stuff. There's a whole list of things. Um, 
And you can do like two spells in a turn. You can do two attacks in a turn. You can move twice in a turn, whatever. Um, that I was initially like, maybe it needs to be three. Maybe it needs to be more. You know, I was worried that people were going to feel like, oh, I didn't get to do stuff or whatever. Um, but after a lot of testing and some fine tuning and some adding some s- compromised combination abilities, like there's a there's a something called a dash action where you can move and do a, like an attack with like a penalty. So there's some hybridization stuff in there. Uh, but we went with two actions and the reason for that after some testing that worked really well was it keeps action, uh, keeps combat fast. Um, so relic, it, a lot of the system kind of comes down to combat when you're in it moves faster, tends to hit a lot harder compared to like five E rounds or something. Uh, more happens and it's your turn again sooner. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that was a really comfortable space we got to after, you know, trying this out with a bunch of different groups and different character builds and all this other stuff. Um, it keeps people more engaged. You know, I think uh, <laughs> maybe I'm projecting as a DM, but uh, it's always a little disheartening when combat is taking an hour around and you're coming around. You realize that like, oh, the wizard's on his phone. All right. It's hey, hey, wake up. It's your turn in five minutes. Let's go figure out what you're going to do. Uh <laughs> So having something cycle through faster and more stuff happens, you're in more danger, you're dealing more damage, you're doing some cool stuff, and then we're done. Uh, just got to a really nice place in terms mm-hmm. of like game experience. Yeah. Now on the monster end of things, I'm obviously the obviously the game's going to have a bestiary, but it's possible Discord silenced you again. Okay. I shall wait. Uh, when it comes to be, when it comes to the bestiary, I'm yeah. assume I'm assuming that I'm ass, I'm assuming that there's going to be a decent variety. Are you going to have any sort of get any sort of guidance or any sort of advice on GMs who want to, for GMs who want to create their own monsters? And, how, and how yes, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that they're not I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, completely TPKs waiting to happen. <laughs> yes so that is actually something that has been the hardest thing actually to balance in this entire endeavor is monster threat levels um so i'll tell you the current state of it and it is something i want to make clear that i am actively still developing on um we have a functional system right now that i want to be more user-friendly and accessible uh without kind of being in the in crowd so that is something that is happening uh So right now on my Discord, um, and I can share it again on there, it's probably been buried at this point, Uh, there is a spreadsheet that has calculations in it where you plug in like monster stats and it spits out like here's kind of what party level and how many characters that's appropriate for. Uh, It's functional. It is resulting in monsters that are powerful enough for the kinds of encounters that I think are appropriate. And there's some guidance on how to like, if you want a hard encounter for a more experienced or tougher party or a tougher campaign, here's what you do. If you want an easier encounter for a little less deadly, whatever, here's how we twist that one way or the other. Um, having said all of that, I just described going to a discord to go to a, uh, spreadsheet to plug in a bunch of math, to spit out a thing that'll tell you what to do, which is not an elegant user experience. (laughs) Uh, so one of my big tasks in the next interim period here is to figure out how to condense all of that down to something much more accessible and make that much more widely available. So that is something that is very much on the radar. It is functional now. If you want to get into the weeds and you know join the community and bat monster ideas around back and forth, uh, we've got people who have done that, who have come up with some cool stuff, and it works. It's just, it's not in its best state yet. Yeah. I think um, one, one So of the there's, things... there's that. That's where that's at. Yeah, I think... I think one of the main things for for me is whether or not is whether or not there's an equivalent of CR and whether or not it has the same issues as CR. I'm pretty sure that's. It sounds like that's not really going to be happening. Um, yeah, I, I've I've condensed I've loosened it up a little bit into uh, we call it a threat level. Um, whatever the idea is to just give gms like an idea of like hey if you throw this dragon at a level three party they're gonna die 
Um, it's I'm trying not to make it as pl- CR tried to do too much in terms of being like for this many parties of this level, da, 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 and then like it immediately breaks because theoretically there are monsters in the monster manual who, according to what CR is claiming to be, should never be fought. Um, and that's not true. Like there are parties of lower level who kill ancient dragons. Like it's just, it doesn't really do what it says on the tin. It's kind of just guideposts. Uh, I'm trying to provide more guidance around like encounter design because that actually tends to matter a lot more as to whether or not a party gets away or gets hurt or gets killed. Um, in terms of like, you know, how many players are on the field? Great. How many monsters are there per player? That's a huge deal. Cause like action economy fricking wins when you talk to 5e or whatever uh generally speaking whichever side of a combat is taking more actions for the longest number of rounds is gonna run away with it like that's how that works so there's a lot more to be done in terms of like hey you want to build a balanced encounter here's what that means it means that some of your players are probably going to get an injury okay that's fine if you don't want that to happen either level the monsters down or reduce the number go this way and then so like there's some kind of a keto around like how to twist some of those expectations into like better prep, which results in kind of de-emphasizing like the, the CR as it were in term and just building like an encounter that will result in the kind of experience you're trying to do as a GM. Mm -hmm. That definitely, that definitely makes sense. So I, I suppose the, the last, one of the last, player facing things I wanted to cover is the equivalent of magic items. And Okay, yeah. Obvious obviously in more in more litigious role playing games, there isn't really much in the way of guidance for creating your own magic items. Um you there's obvious there's a decent um setup when it comes to equipment, but when it comes to magic items, are you relying on on specific slots or you rel- do you have your own um particular set on how you handle magic items or not? Uh, in terms of like, you can't wear 10 rings or in terms of like where the ideas for items and everything are coming from. Like, what are you, what are you driving at? A little of column A and a little of column B. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, we don't have a lot of like really set rules around it. Uh, what I've provided in the system and something probably to expand on further um, is guidelines around like what kinds of power level items are appropriate for like different levels of play. So, and you can always break that and it leads to some interesting campaigns. Uh, but you know, you don't want the, the sword of world smashing Mjolnir's hammer, or whatever in the level one party most of the time. Uh, so there's some brackets around like, Hey, you know, if you're building a legendary world shattering death artifact, it's probably good for players of like 18 plus. There you go. Level wise. Um, in terms of like mechanical restrictions, there's not a ton. I think, well, and maybe I should define this a little bit better in the running the game section, which I can do. Um, I think there's uh, some assumptions around like, yeah, you probably have two rings, an amulet, whatever. Um, you can't wear 10 hats. It doesn't work. <laughs> and some of the items say stuff like that. Like, like we have a category of items that are, it's called a ward, um, which is like a disposable magic item. So like it'll prevent one injury and then destroy itself kind of deal. Uh, but there's some rules around like you have to wear it for 24 hours before it'll do anything and you can't wear more than one or they don't work. So, you know, there's some stuff like that to kind of keep things within bounds of, of, of feasible, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of inspiration, I mean, it's so the monsters and the items are the two areas where this year we're going to be adding a lot more content. Um, and obviously, it's an open game. So welcome to homebrew. People are, are encouraged and I would be excited to promote if anyone wants to make their own stuff and put it out there. Um, and if uh, like with monster threat levels, it's something that I need to work on defining better for the homebrew crowd how to level something appropriately uh, right now there's there's kind of a clunky slash experiential system of like oh this sword probably deserves to be in the rare category um, but it's not 
well enough defined to really put that out as like, this is the rule. This is how you decide if it does this, if it does that. Um, so there needs to be a little bit more of that developed or at least better precedence. And uh, I think we'll get that as we kind of add to the roster, add to the catalog. Mm-hmm. And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how that develops. For sure. For sure. But with that, with that said, I'd like, let- um, what are you shooting for as far as a page count? For the Kickstarter? Um, so I can tell you that the rule books together are about 32 pages right now, and those are basically done. I'm adding some artwork and, and tweaking some stuff. Um, the first adventure, I suspect, is still being finished, uh, so we're not fully through layout and everything yet, but that's going to be about 20 to 30, you know, probably about 25 pages. Um, and then each additional adventure that is being added in the Kickstarter right now, we're unlocking number four will fall between 20 and 40 pages, depending on complexity. Uh, so it's a series of small modules. They're all intended to be not like a full one to 20 campaign. This is more of like a sampler kit of like this first adventure is supposed to take about six hours, three to six hours. If you're really super aggressive and you kill all the NPCs, it'll take about three. Uh, don't do that. It's well, do it. I don't know. Be murder hobos. Have fun. Um, so each of these adventures is supposed to be two, three, maybe four or five like gameplay sessions as like a kickoff for a campaign or a drop in or a, Hey, we want to get together and try out Relict and see if we like it and see if it's for us and then get our own games going or delve further into the setting or whatever as we kind of add more content and expand on it throughout the year. Uh, so not one contiguous book, a series of modules that are all building up to the broader world setting, which will be coming out probably next year. I'm not, I don't want to say quarter what part of next year yet because there's a lot of stuff between now and then that's got to happen uh but these are all existing within the same world it's called rubica uh that uh the podcast i don't know if you checked out the sounds like adventure podcast take place in one of the cities there that was a lot of fun um so this world is sort of being built and we're setting these adventures within it and that's kind of what this kickstarter is helping kind of seed and get happening yeah i can i can certainly get that so with that with that said, I'll certainly be looking forward to how it develops. And I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my show, my temple, and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Well, I appreciate it, Mildred. I, uh, I, I want people to appreciate how diligent Mildred has been in getting a hold of me. There was a kerfuffle. Um, I, sh- should, I, should I just tell him? Like, I, yeah, uh, I, screwed, I got nothing to I screwed hide. up. <laughs> uh, I screwed up. I accidentally had blocked Mildra like two years ago, and for no good reason. Uh, it's pure user error on my part, and I'm terribly embarrassed. And he has been both persistent and a professional about allowing me to kind of uh, come back hat in hand, like, hey, buddy, I messed up. I'm sorry. Um, so I really appreciate that. Uh, Josh from Lone Colossus is a great guy. Uh, he acted as an intermediary and sent me a message a couple of days ago like, uh, hey, dumbass, you know, Mildred's been trying to get a hold of you. I'm like, what? <laughs> um, he didn't say dumbass. Josh is too polite for that. But uh, mm, yeah, good, good, good stuff. Don't, don't hold his nicest against him. He's Minnesotan. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, I know yeah, somebody's going to turn that in, turn that on me and say, "Well, you're Minnesotan, aren't what? Why aren't you nice? I am nice. I'm nice because I'm nice because I riff on everybody equally." Yeah, see, that's all you that's all you can ask for. Mm-hmm. But like, I but um, anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I yeah, always fantastic. say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I will cheers to that. Uh, <laughs> and of course, well, thank you. a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay... Fucking frosty, everybody. 
Oh, too fun.